Hello Blazers, welcome to episode 80 of UAB Green and Told, original release date Monday, September 12th, 2022. Through our podcast, we are able to share stories from members of the UAB community. Be sure to listen back to past episodes at alumni.uab.edu slash greenandtold on Spotify or the Apple Podcasts app. While there, leave a written review to help more alumni find our podcast. I'm Greg Berry, a UAB alum and director in the Office of Alumni Affairs. Mark Petway is a Birmingham guy through and through. And while you may know him as sheriff of Jefferson County, Alabama, you may not know the man behind the badge or the woman behind him. Today, we'll discover how the couple not only chose UAB, but how they wound up getting together. It was our friends, actually, that just started saying, are y'all dating? And we would go, no, we're not dating. We're just friends. <laughs> <And> then, <laughs> so it was our friends, really, that made us think, maybe we are dating. We're hanging out quite a bit. Plus, the sheriff will share how he didn't exactly choose law enforcement as a career, but rather, it was the other way around. For me, it was not initially what I was looking to do. I was looking to work with computers. But uh, when I got into law enforcement, I started liking it. And while Mark holds the title of sheriff, we'll find out who is actually in charge at home. Because any given day, any given, given moment, that challenge can be he or I. Mark and Vanessa's path to UAB are different. Vanessa grew up in rural Lowndes County, Alabama. Mark, in the shadows of Legion Field in Birmingham Smithfield community. But they do share similarities. Both are children of teachers, and both took a serendipitous journey into their professional careers. <laughs> you know, it was interesting. My career, my initial career um, in studies, I would say, was focused on medical technology, and um, when I got to UAB, you did your basics, right? Biology, chemistry, physics. I thought I may go to medical school. Met a dear friend and I reached out to her to see, you know, what she was doing with her science career. And she said, you know, I'm going into pharmacy. I said, oh, pharmacy sounds like a great option. She, she was leaving UAB, going to pharmacy over at Sanford. So after getting into organic chemistry, which I call the great divide for those that are seeking medical school, <laughs> <laughs> if you could get through successfully organic chem, you're on your way. Well, organic chemistry and I had a challenge. So I reached out to her. I said, what are you doing? You know, tell me more about this pharmacy. She says, oh, I'm not doing pharmacy anymore. I'm doing nuclear medicine technology. Oh, wow. And I said, what? What is that? And um, I did a, um, a tour over with the School of Health-Related Professions. Nuclear medicine technology became my career. I finished my bachelor's in biology and chemistry, a second bachelor's in nuclear medicine technology. So um, that's pretty much, you know, I got to UAB actually by a detour. I started at AUM in Montgomery yeah. and, um, and finished and made a decision after my second year to transfer to UAB. And I'm glad I did, because that's where I met this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and this guy, Sheriff, you're a Birmingham guy. So was it UAB from the get-go? You knew you were going to go? Because I've heard a lot of stories. People, kind of like Vanessa, they start somewhere else, and then they kind of gravitate and transition to UAB. Well, I started at Jefferson State Junior College, and I transferred over to UAB. And uh, UAB was one of the schools that my, my mother went to uh, post her bachelor's degree to get another degree. UAB was right here, it was local. Uh, had a lot of friends attending UAB. Most of my friends I grew up with, they attended UAB. UAB was very much growing, it was changing. Um, the numbers at UAB were really picking up during the 80s. So UAB was a, a school on the on the move, it was growing. So I chose to go along to, uh, after I finished Jefferson State to UAB to uh, continue my studies. So Vanessa alluded to it just a little bit that UAB is where you guys met. So this relationship can be traced to the university. Take me into that first meeting and, and what you both remember from that time. I went to the school uh, because I heard about the choir. I was uh, not- It was a, a Bible study actually. All right, it was a Bible study. And um, I was wanting to ask them to come out to my church to be a part of our youth ministry on, on a Sunday that we had for Youth Sunday. I did get a chance to meet them during the Bible study. 
and it was during the holidays, so they were getting ready to go. Vanessa was getting ready to go home for the holidays, and uh, so she gave me her, her contact information. I said, hey, the holidays are over with. We'll, we'll, I'll contact you to see if we can get together next year and be able to help have you all to come out to my church. So that is how we initially met. Now, you left out a little bit, though, because it was through the Baptist Student Union. It used to be on campus. I don't mm -hmm. know if it's still there. But that Baptist Student Union was thriving in uh, what year was that that we met? 91, somewhere around there, 90. So um, a lot of the youth, especially that had, you know, like Christian faith, we would gather at the Baptist Student Union. I don't think it's even there anymore. And every Thursday night, we would have a Bible study and there would be multiple activities for the youth to engage in. And we formed a choir. So I started directing that choir and that's the choir he's mentioning that he wanted to have come and, um, and perform at his church for a youth Sunday. But yeah, it was through that Bible study that we actually drew closer to Christ and we drew closer to each other during that time. As a new couple, in Birmingham dating in the early 90s. What was there to do? What did you guys do for fun? <laughs> That's a good question. What did we do? We, we did go to a lot of church conventions. As a matter of fact, one of the first uh, dates that we went on uh, was to a church convention with the uh, Church of God in Christ where uh, they had a, a performing artist, uh, Maddie Mouse Clark and her daughter, um, which is part of the Clark Sisters. They were here in town yeah. and I've always wanted to meet them. I've always admired them. Right. And that was my opportunity and chance to get to meet them. And we went there, we stayed all night long. Yeah, it was almost past great. midnight. Yeah. And also uh, bowling, we like to bowl a lot. Um, what other activities there do? What? The movies, the movies, a big fan of the movies. movies. Yeah. So um, and we did do our fair share of uh, catching all the new flicks coming out. And just, you know, just having fun. You know, his family, he's from a large family. I would say large. You don't find, <laughs> you know, six kids very often in, in, in the 90s that, you know, in families that large. So sitting around at his house, playing games, watching sports on TV, they were huge sports fans, five boys and one girl. So I hung out at his house with his family quite a bit. And um, they were big card players. <laughs> and uh, that was a great, a great pastime. And picnics, we love to cook out. So we did a lot of that, yeah. Mr. So Sheriff, what was it about Vanessa that drew you to her? Oh, no, she seemed to be a very genuine person. Uh, and she had a love for the Lord. That was something I was really seeking. Someone uh, who loved the Lord, someone who was genuine and real. And somebody who who had an interest in like me, and those were some of the things I was looking for, and and I said, hey, I think I found that here, right here, and um, and we've been together ever since. We started out as friends, doing a lot of things as friends, and the relationship just grew, and uh, from there, just saw a lot of things, a lot of qualities that I wanted, and uh, we just been together ever since. Vanessa, I'll flip the question to you. What drew you to the sheriff? You know, I was at a point in my life where I felt like I needed God more. And I really wasn't seeking a relationship. And it was through our seeking a stronger relationship with Christ that I found a like friendship in him. So I think it was through our seeking greater relationship with Jesus Christ that we looked up and found out that, hey, we actually like each other more. <laughs> And that friendship turned into uh, a love for each other. Uh, but I absolutely loved his heart. He was genuine. Uh, Mark is a giver, a genuine giver. I was just blown away by how compassionate he was and how he naturally gave to the legitimate needs of others. Just any need he saw that he could meet, he would give. He would give without question. Um, and, and that was something, I have many stories that I can share on that. I don't even think you have time for that. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, he's a natural giver and it blew me away to see him take time out for senior citizens, take time out for disabled individuals, visiting people at nursing homes, making sure that the elderly in the church and in the community were taken care of. 
you don't find many young men in their 20s doing that. And I was amazed by that, actually. And that's really one of the things that attracted me to him. Yep. From the time you started dating, how long before you guys kind of looked at each other and said, you know what? He's the one or she's the one. I would say it was within a few months. How, how long was it for you? I don't know. I, I, I think we were spending so much time together that it just, you know, wasn't thinking about it. It just, just was a happen. natural thing and it just naturally happened. And you know how it is when you're not around someone, you miss that person that, that, that kind of grow onto that person. I think it was something that we grew into each other and, uh, and we just continued to grow even after that. Yeah, it was our friends actually that just started saying, are y'all dating? And we would go, no, we're not dating, we're just friends. <laughs> <And> then, <laughs> so it was our friends really that made us think, maybe we are dating, we're hanging out quite a bit, yeah. Was it easy to date while you were at UAB? You know what, I saw a lot of my friends that were there, um, they ended up marrying the person that they were dating yeah, at UAB. That's true. And they're still married today. So yeah, I would say it was it was fairly easy dating. Um, I think if I were to say this to anyone else, you find like interest, right? UAB had a vital part to play in that. Absolutely. So transitioning from UAB out into the real world, did you graduate, get married, and then start jobs? How did that progression lay out for the two of you? Exactly like that. We graduated, we got jobs, and we got married. And we were engaged when I was finishing my first degree. And I thought that after I graduated with my biology and chemistry degree, that that meant we could get married. And, but remember I started a second career uh, degree program in nuclear medicine, mm -hmm. and it just happened to require another 18 months and I would have a second bachelor's. So he was like, oh no, you just started another 18 month program. So now we're gonna have to wait till after. <laughs> after you finish that degree and then we can get married so we dated three years mainly because i was finishing up degrees and um and then we got married and two years to the day we had our first child she was born on our second wedding anniversary oh wow what were those first career steps after you got the degrees and you ventured out into the professional world. Uh, Cheryl, for you, was it policing and getting into law enforcement at the time? I was. I, uh, I was working for the city of Birmingham as a correction officer over at the jail. And um, I worked there two years. And uh, I left there and went to work for the city of Fairfield uh, right after that. It was still in law enforcement. So uh, ever since I've been married to Vanessa, I've been in law enforcement. It is, I guess, a career for me. It was not initially what I was looking to, to do. I was looking to work with computers. But um, when I got into law enforcement, I started liking it. Computers started speeding up. I got behind in what was happening in the computer field. And I just stuck with what was going on with the law enforcement field. And I progressed from there. And um, I've been here in law enforcement ever since. With a degree in nuclear medicine, what did you do? Ah, that's a good question. So I, you know, finishing at UAB, UAB has a nuclear medicine department, and I was fortunate to finish at UAB and apply for the position of a nuclear med technologist right there at the at UAB hospital and was given the opportunity to start my career there. I worked at UAB for six years. Uh, but nuclear medicine is all about metabolic imaging. It actually uses radioactive imaging agents to look at the functioning of organs. So it's different from x-ray where x-ray looks at structure, nuclear medicine looks at function and it uses radioisotopes to do it. Of course, UAB being like the renal transplant capital probably in the nation, one of the top. So we did a lot of renal imaging and I spent a lot of my time you know, doing evaluations for renal transplantation. Uh, and then I focused a lot in nuclear cardiology. We have a very top-notch cardiology um, program at the University of Alabama. And nuclear cardiology is, is a very important uh, procedure in assessing the 
viable coronary arteries, you know, in the health of our patients. So I focused there the latter part of my six years, and then I left and, and went to work for new uh, cardiology PC, and they are still one of the largest cardiology uh, practices in the state of Alabama. Currently, they have this large facility over at the Colonnade. So I worked for Cardiology PC for three years, managing their nuclear cardiology department. And that's how I got and transitioned into pharmaceutical sales. Um, the representative that was selling the nuclear isotopes that we used to image the heart left his position and recommended me as a great replacement. And I interviewed for the job. And lo and behold, 22 years later, I'm still in the pharmaceutical industry. I've done many things in that industry, but it started um, through UAB, Nuclear Medicine Department, led me uh, straight into my pharmaceutical career. For both of you, it just seems like the careers happened serendipitously because you didn't know that this is where you both were going to end up. One was going to go into computers. The other one was thinking, All right, maybe pharmaceuticals. <laughs> right, right, right. I was thinking medicine. And then I ended up, you know, in the pharmaceutical industry, but it's been a phenomenal ride. And I uh, would love to encourage a lot of young folks to consider career paths in the pharmaceutical industry. And, it, and now um, there are many pathways into pharmaceuticals, um, but uh, I'm grateful that I had the, the pathway of nuclear medicine. It, it really gave me a, a strong start. You both have spent a couple of decades in the same career fields along your career tra trajectory. So Vanessa, how have you seen your career kind of change and, and the whole industry change? You know, technology is, is definitely changed it all, right? It's been the game changer. But over the course of my career, things have changed from the one aspect, it's what the industry requires, what it requires of the workforce and how do you show up every day compared to what I anticipated years ago. Um, strategy, strategic thinking, that critical thinking, problem solving. Um, no longer, especially in the pharma industry, are you given the model to say, this is what you do. You are kind of given a pathway that says this structure may ensure success but so much of what we do is innovative now. We're agile. We have to respond to the market changes and changes in healthcare policies and laws. And so we need brilliant minds, people that are uh, what I call can live in a world of ambiguity. Like it's not always clear what the next move is going to be, but you're stronger uh, by the teams that are around you. Uh, you learn to appreciate teams work well with teams, realizing that not one person is an island. You don't need to know everything, uh, but you do celebrate the gifts and challenge and the, uh, the values that others bring. And so in 22 years, I started as a sales rep. I've done um, managing teams, sales pharmaceutical teams. I do operations and I currently now oversee operations for a Japanese company in the pharmaceutical industry. So I've kind of like evolved and, but all of it came as a result of being agile, being comfortable with change and, and ambiguity and leveraging the, the strengths of teams around you. Sure, if you've been in law enforcement for 20, 25 years, how have you seen policing change over, over a quarter century worth of a career? The crime has not changed. The crime is still the same. We're fighting the same crime that we were fighting 25 years ago. But some of the things that I have seen change, uh, more diversity within law enforcement now that we had back 25 years ago. Um, we're pushing more diversity, where there's um, a lot more females in the law enforcement that we didn't have years ago. They're uh, moving up. Uh, diversity is one of the big pushes that we have. Technology is another big push that we have. Uh, because we live in a, in a tech technical society. A lot of crimes nowadays are committed using technology. So you have to have a brain to actually go out there to uh, solve a lot of the crimes that's going on. And we have to keep up with uh, what's going on, the trends and the things that's going on to make sure that we can uh, track the crime and stay ahead of the crim criminal. Uh, they out there every day thinking of new ways to get your money. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a challenge. So we have to have um, 
people with technical minds to come into law enforcement now. Not just all bronze and strength, but we have to have great minds to come in there and do technical things and, and to do forensics, to make sure that um, we, we're going in the right direction to be able to solve the, the uh, cases that we have. Do you guys ever see the two careers kind of blend where they overlap at any point? I think they do. Um, now, one thing I could definitely say is that uh, when I first met her, she was in the medical field. A lot of people in law enforcement end up marrying people in the medical field. Oh, and I don't know, it's just, a, it's like a magnet or something that attracts and draws those two careers together, people of those two careers together. I don't know how it happens, but the majority of the people that I work with are married to someone that's in the medical field. So it, 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 it just works that way. Um, some kind of way it just happens and works that way. Yeah, you know, and I part of my career in pharmaceuticals, I spent about 10 years focused on medications that treat mental illness. And I see that being an overlay into uh, law enforcement because as you've seen lately in the news, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the, uh, what do we call mass murders or um, what are they called? I may be missing the term. Mass shootings, yeah. Mass shootings. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of that is correlated to mental health. And I've been an advocate for mental health awareness, mainly because I spent 10 years talking to psychiatrists and psychologists and, and even caregivers and patients. And I understand how so often they are misunderstood. Many of the patients lack the insight to even understand what is going on with their bodies and why there is a need for treatment. And we need to, you know, lessen the stigma that is associated with receiving a, you know, treatment and seeking out psychiatry and psych and counseling. And so I talked to Sheriff about that a lot. And, um, and even when he ran for initially for Sheriff, uh, that was a very prominent platform for him. And he's even done some amazing things. Most recently, it's been in the news about the opening of a crisis diversion center for the first time ever here in Jefferson County. Um, so that law enforcement officers have an option now, instead of taking patients that qualify for mentally ill, instead of taking them to the jail, they now go directly to a crisis intervention center to get the help they need instead of being placed in a jail cell where many times they go progressively worse, hurting themselves or even others. So I would like to think that I've been an influence on him in that, in that way, being an, you know, a voice for a community that has so often been under, uh, overlooked or, or, and misunderstood. If I'm not mistaken, you were elected a couple of years ago as the first black sheriff for Jefferson County. Are you surprised it took that long to happen? I am kind of. Um, we've had some great leadership here uh, within Jefferson County. I was not looking to be the first um, African American to become sheriff, but it just so happened to fail upon me. And I thank God for that. Uh, but we have had good leadership here uh, within those years uh, before I got into law enforcement. Some of my mentors, such as Chief Johnny Johnson and and uh, Chief Annette Nunn, uh, those individuals have poured into me and they still pour into me. Uh, and I've talked to other leaders that were here that were in law enforcement, those that uh, I worked under, at, even at Fairfield. They have been a tremendous help to me and helped build me up to where I am right now to make me the person that I am. So uh, I hear their voice, they hold me accountable. And uh, we, we've had good people here it's just that it was not their turn. It just so happily it fell upon me. Vanessa, I've heard you refer to him as sheriff. I mean, you call him sheriff, but sheriff, who's really in charge of the dynamic between the two of you? <laughs> <laughs> now that's funny, because any given day, any given given moment, that challenge can be he or I. We're constantly. I think that's why we laugh a lot. We laugh quite a bit because we're constantly like, now who's in charge now? Is it me or is it you? Because we both run organizations, right? And uh, we're in decision-making positions every day. So oftentimes as a wife, being Christ-minded, I am submitted 
but I challenge it sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I, I like to glow with being adaptable and try to be peaceful and and, uh, and maintain a peaceful environment. To me, it, it keeps me even keel. I want to be able to be a person that everybody likes to be around. And so I try to maintain a certain level at all times. You do that very well, you do. And, yeah. um, and people at work will tell you the same thing. That's Vanessa Petway and Sheriff Mark Petway. Vanessa has two degrees from UAB, has a double major in nuclear medicine technology and biology. She's currently director of operations for a pharmaceutical company, while her husband is still sheriff of Jefferson County. Together, they are truly a power couple that plays off of each other's emotions and success. And they definitely have a great idea of what it means to be a blazer. I think it means to be constantly innovative and evolving because that's what UAB represents to me. When we first came to University of Alabama, Birmingham, it was a few streets. Now it's like a city <laughs> within a city. And, and it brings about such great pride to say that you are a blazer. And one of the reasons that I think um, those of us that carry that blazer pride, uh, that we do so so proudly is because we love to see what UAB has evolved to become and the reputation it has, not just in the South, in the Southeast, but around the world. And it's because of innovation, it's because of great minds and talents. And uh, so to be a blazer, you're constantly evolving. You have a mindset that you're not, you're not resting. You're constantly looking for the next best representation of yourself. UAB is a great school. Uh, it's growing, I saw the sports. So that, that builds up everything about the school when you see uh, changes like that, when you're growing on every level. So that brings about a change in pride within the school when they start winning. But um, we pretty much uh, enjoy the spirit of the school. I, I have great pride in, in telling people that and let them know that this is the best. Be sure to listen into previous episodes of UAB Green and Told. You can find all of them at alumni.uab.edu slash green and told. Know someone we should reach out to for the podcast? Email greenandtold at uab.edu. Finally, be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for UAB alumni. Thanks for listening. And until next time, go Blazers.